All right, so as I already mentioned, as you already know, the, the topic that I'm preaching on tonight, and the title of my sermon is The Eternal Sonship of Jesus Christ. So we know that Jesus Christ, of course, is the Son of God. He claimed to be the Son of God. We see that all throughout the Scripture. He's the Son of God. Now, there's many different aspects to Jesus being the Son of God. There's... there's there's a lot of, of meaning behind that. It's not any one thing necessarily. We're going to get to that a little bit more when I get to the word begotten. He's the only begotten of the Father. He's the first begotten. There's different ways that he is begotten. So one way you could say is he was physically born into this world through Mary. Right? That is one way or one reason why he's the son of God, because physically he had a mother of Mary who carried him as he grew in the womb as a human being. But his father was God. So being the son of God, he was the son of, uh, of God. Like li literally in a physical sense, that's how he came to be when he walked this earth. But that wasn't his origin. That wasn't Jesus Christ's beginning. He's been around all through, from everlasting and to everlasting. He's also was begotten by, and we're going to get to this in a minute too, begotten when he was begotten again from the dead. So when his, at his resurrection is another time he's talked about as being begotten of the Father. And then um, I believe, and I'm going to teach, that eternally Jesus has always been the Son of God. That he didn't only become the Son of God when he came into human form on this earth. I believe he was always the Son of God That in the Trinity. Because we believe here in the Trinity that uh, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 7 that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. We believe that here. There's three persons in the Godhead. And when I say persons, I mean persons, persons in the sense that they have wills, which is evident where Jesus says, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And he's expressing two different wills in um, also in the sense that there are uh, there's a power structure in the sense of, well, Jesus submitting himself unto the Father, right? We see that all throughout Scripture, that there is a structure. We see when Jesus Christ comes and rules and reigns, all power and authority is going to be given unto him for the thousand years that he reigns, and then he's going to give authority back to the Father, and, and you can't have this without having persons. However, while there are three persons, there is still one God. And those three the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are one, and they're one God. We believe they're one in essence, they're one in their being as far as being a God. But there are three persons to the Godhead. Now, it is important to understand this, that the, the characteristics that we understand about the Godhead, that the, the, between the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the Father have always been the way that they are now, that it's not like there was some change just because Jesus came into this world physically uh, through Mary. Galatians 4, we're gonna, I'm going to prove this to you from Scripture. Like I said, everything that I teach or preach, I'm going to try to, my best to prove to you with the most clear Scriptures that we have. And this is an important doctrine because this has to do with who God is. It has to do with who Jesus is, who God is, and just this aspect. Because with the heresy that's being taught now, this oneness that there's one God and His name is Jesus, and, and it completely just denies the three persons of the Godhead, teaches that Jesus was not always the Son of God going into eternity past. That it was some new thing that like Jesus was just came, almost came into being. I mean, depending on who you're talking about, what they believe, it, it's, it gets kind of weird, but it, but it really is like this, all of a sudden now he's the Son of God and it's just because he was physically born. And we're going to, it is wicked, and we're going we're gonna to dismantle that. I'm going to show you why we believe what we believe here, and that he was always the Son of God. And that it, it, this goes back to eternity. So in Galatians chapter 4, look at verse number 4, the Bible reads, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. 
And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This morning I was talking about the importance of understanding even salvation because of this concept of a father and a son. This whole, there's a big theme in the Bible of a father and a son between God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. There is a love that's expressed and the, the love that God can Commendeth his love that he hath given, you know, that he's that he gives his only begotten son. There, there's so much about this that it's so inherent and, and, and needs to be um, just proclaimed and stood upon that, that Jesus Christ has always been the Son of God. But what we see here in Galatians 4, verse number 4, it says that God sent forth his son. Now, how could God have sent his son if his son didn't exist yet? I mean, just think about this kind of logically, right? God the Father in heaven. The fullness, he's like, the time is come, right? The time that he had already planned for Jesus Christ to come into this earth and to live his life and do his ministry and die on the cross and everything that he had to do to be that Passover lamb. To, to be the propitiation for our sins, the plan that God had from the beginning, that he always knew about, that, he, that, that this is the way it's going to be. The fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. Now if he sent forth, his, he didn't say he sent forth the word, he said he sent forth his son. Now Jesus is the word, there's no problem with that, that's fine. God, in general, has many names. God is not known by any one name. Even Jesus isn't known by any one name. But for here, in the Bible, say God sent His Son. The Son had to be there for Him to be sent. The Son was there. Proving that before, and that's why it goes on to say that He was uh, made of a woman. Made under the law. Now, when it says made, it doesn't mean like he came into being, that was his origins. But humanly speaking, physically speaking, that's how he came into this earth. Made of a woman, made under the law, like us. And, that's, and, and the, the relation is being there now between us and Christ. So we have a high priest that, that can be approached unto, it can be handled. He knows all, everything that we go through. God experienced what it's like to be a human being coming in the flesh when Jesus Christ came here and lived and died. And we have this extra, you know, a great connection as well with God through Jesus Christ because he did that. But just the wording here is showing, you that, showing us that God sent forth His Son. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to see something very similar. It's the same type of concept about God sending His Son. Now, you'll notice we're not going to have to do any mental acrobats to try to understand this doctrine. And, and, you know, pay attention to that. Because the truth from God's Word, even the really deep truths, don't require all kinds of jumping around and take this part of this verse here and this part of this verse in order to explain it. If you've got to do that, there's probably something wrong. Especially when it comes to who God is. We, we don't need to jump around. We don't, we don't need to, to prop up a bunch of things with things that aren't clear. When the Bible clearly says God sent forth His Son, His Son had to have been there for Him to send. Very simple, very basic, very rudimentary. 1 John chapter 4, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Again, God sent His only begotten Son. Verse number 10, Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 
Jesus' whole mission was to be the Savior of the world. That's why he came. That's why he was born at Bethlehem. He fulfilled the prophecy of the Scripture that goes all the way back to the beginning, that, that the Savior was to come, the Christ was to come. Savior of the world. Jesus knew this. The Father knew this. And when the time came, the Father said, Okay, son, now it's time for you to go. Now I'm sending you to do this work. And he did. And the, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 20. Actually, you know what? Just turn, turn to John chapter 1. Turn, sorry, just flip, flip a little bit forward to John chapter 1. Backwards, I mean, John chapter 1. I'll just read John 20, 20 for you because this is, basically it's all the same point. God sent his son. Uh, John 20, 20 reads, And when he had so said, he showed unto, him, unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Um, again, the Father sent the Son. It's the same point. I want to belabor that point. It's all throughout Scripture. Uh, John chapter 1. Now we're going to talk about the word begotten because there's a lot, a lot of um, emphasis is laid on this of Jesus Christ. Well, that he, wasn't, he didn't become the Son until he was begotten, right? And that's what they'll say. And don't be deceived by this because, like I mentioned, there are multiple reasons why Jesus Christ is called the Son of God. One of those reasons is when he was physically born. It was, it was very easy to call Jesus Christ when he was physically born the Son of God because God was his father when Mary was his mother. That makes sense, but that is not the only reason why Jesus is called the Son of God. But let's read John 1, verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see he's the only begotten of the Father. And pay attention to that because there's, there's definitely distinctions. The only one. How is he the only begotten of the Father versus the first begotten? Because there's another verse that we're going to see. Uh, turn if you would to Acts chapter 13. And I'll re we're going to go to Hebrews 1 also. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of Scripture we're going to look at. So if you want to kind of get yourself ready, we're going to look at Acts 13 and then Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, 6 is the one that says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And that was referring to Jesus. In John 1, we see the only begotten. In Hebrews 1, we see the first begotten. Why? It's because it's talking about two different events, or two different beginnings, if you will. It's not all just talking about one thing. You're in Acts 13, look at verse number 33. The Bible says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So the people who want to deny the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ will use verses like this. Well, see, this day have I begotten thee. So he wasn't a son until this day. He says, well, because he says right here, this is the day now that he's begotten. So he wasn't a son before that, but now he is begotten. The problem with that, though, when you use verses like this, especially this one specifically, because this is quoting the Psalms, the Psalm 2 specifically, this is in reference to the resurrection of Christ. Him being begotten again of the dead. So Psalm 2, when he says, This day have I begotten thee, 
It wasn't talking about Mary giving birth to Jesus, about him being begotten in that sense. This is referring to him being begotten of the dead, being born of the dead, that his dead body came back to life when he resurrected. So in this sense, he's the first begotten of the dead because he is the first man that had his body resurrected in its glorified state, in its glorified form. The same way that we as believers, our bodies will be resurrected at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So when he comes back, we will experience this same type of beginning from the dead. Our dead bodies will rise up and we will be begot our bodies will be begotten again. Um, at the return of Jesus Christ. So that's why Jesus was the first or the first fruits. And after them, um, they that are dead at his coming, and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. So um, this psalm is specifically saying, it's talking about his resurrection. Let's keep reading that. Verse 33, we'll read it again. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Obviously he's talking about Jesus Christ, he's talking about him being, being begotten, and the Father saying this, this day have I begotten thee is his resurrection from the dead. So in that sense, he's the son of God. In the sense that with his resurrected body, he's the son of God. He was begotten that day, the day he was raised again from the dead. It's another beginning. It's another reason why he could be called the son of God. Not just from the physical birth, but from his uh, resurrection or his second birth, if you will. I mean, it's not really a birth, but his, his beginning from the dead. That's the term that the Bible uses. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's look at this. Hebrews chapter 1. And we're start reading in verse number one of Hebrews one. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, of whose person? The Father's person. And that's, again, another reason why we believe in persons. It actually is a biblical word to use that there are three persons in the Godhead because the Father is a person and the Son is the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And again, sitting on the right hand, it's, I don't see how you can't see two separate persons within, within the Godhead. Continuing on verse number four, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And again, the inheritance only comes from being a father-son type of relationship. That's where an inheritance even comes from. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. What a great passage. Hebrews 1, 8, we always use that to show the deity of Christ. We have God the Father speaking to the Son, saying, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That Jesus is God. But then we also see at the same time 
that Jesus has a God. In verse 9, therefore, uh, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And so, as you know, humanly speaking, as, as when Jesus Christ on this, or on this earth, of course, he was giving reverence to God, you know, he was God and he was with God. Like as John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word is with God, the word was God. So he could be with God and be God at the same time because God the Father is God, God the Holy Spirit is God, so you can be with another element of the Godhead and still be God um, in his own right. So here, though, it's saying the first begotten into the world, which means if there's a first begotten, then there's others to come. And the first begetting here, I believe, is talking about um, his resurrection, just as the other one did. Because if he's the only begotten, the way he's the only begotten of the, the, of the Father is him being the Son in eternity past. Because you look at even Adam is called the son of God when you look through the genealogy. Where um, we're going backwards, I believe it's in Genesis, where it goes back through the genealogy and then it goes all the way back to, you know, to Seth and to Adam, it says, which is the son of God. And Adam's even referred to as a son of God. Now he's not Jesus Christ, he's not God in the flesh, but he's called the son of God as being God's creation. Now... Turn if you would to Micah chapter 5. I'm going to give you another reference of the Son of God existing or before He actually became flesh and being referred to as the Son of God from 1 John 3, verse number 8. 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the Son of God is in heaven, and the purpose being that the devil sinneth from the beginning, and that is the reason why the Son of God was then manifested in the flesh, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why the Son existed, then He had to be manifested. So it's, you know, again, you look at the language that the Bible uses, and it's clear that the Son of God was already there, pre existing to be ever being on this earth in physical form. Micah 5 2, the Bible reads, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, come, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, this particular verse per se isn't necessarily a, a you know, oneness versus Trinitarian verse, but what it's doing is it's showing that Jesus Christ, who is to, to come, his goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Of course, Jesus is eternally existing. And what's interesting about this, though, is that in uh, the new versions, there's one reason why we're King James only, Micah 5.2 is actually a little bit different in the NIV. And it's a very important distinction. The Bible says, not the Bible, the NIV says, and I have, I have this copied here in my notes, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And that's a big deal because there's a difference between his goings forth and his origins. An origin is a beginning. It's like a creation. It's a start date. It is, I have an origin. I, my origin is my birth, right? My birthday would be my origin. Jesus Christ did not have an origin. And it even says here that his, his origins are from of old, just from ancient times. It, that's just a long time ago. That's different than from everlasting. And this is the reason why it's so important what Bible we use. Because this is teaching something different. Jesus doesn't have an origin. Jesus always has been. But Jesus always has been the Son of God. And what the oneness crowd is doing, it's practically giving Jesus an origin. 
They're saying, well, Jesus didn't exist until he was born out of Mary's womb. Or at least until the seed was conceived, the, the Holy Ghost, like all of a sudden that's Jesus Christ's origin. And that's wicked and that's blasphemy. Turn if you would to Colossians chapter number 1. I want to point this out as well because another piece of evidence that we can look at as to why would you believe in the eternal sonship of, of Jesus Christ? Why do you believe that it wasn't just when he became a human being that he's called the Son of God? Well, another scriptural reference for this is that the Bible refers to the Son as creating everything, as being a creator. So we know that God the Father used the Son to do the creation, but, but Jesus Christ is being referred to as um, He who created all things. But it refers to the Son. It doesn't refer to Jesus, it doesn't refer to the Word, it says the Son created. Colossians 1 is one of the references for this. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13 the Bible reads, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now, this is talking about the Son, right? The kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, the in whom is referring to the Son, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So again, we're maintaining, I just want to make this clear as we go through this, the who, the whom, it's all referring to the Son. Verse number 16, for by Him were all things created. The subject hasn't changed. We're still talking about the Son, His dear Son. By Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And just continuing on to make sure that we didn't switch context here, and He is the head of the body, the church. Ephesians 5 will tell you who the head of the church is. It's Jesus Christ who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Now, while we're on this point, because the first point I'm just mentioning that it's the kingdom of his dear son, and the son, it says, by him were all things created. By the son. So the son was in existence in eternity past at creation at the very least. But some people might turn this because there's other passages that'll say, like, that it looks like God the Father created everything. Okay? How can they both be true? Well, it's very simple, very easy to understand. You employ your son, do you not, Brother Miller? If someone came to you and said, I want this house built, right, or I want this work done, and you send your son to do that work, wouldn't it still be true that you got that work done? I mean, you, 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 you might have delegated some of the work to someone else, but then it could also be said that he got the job done. Right? Do you see how they both can be true at the same exact time? Well, it can be said of God the Father that he cre He's created everything. If He created it all through Jesus, it can be said that Jesus created everything. It's not a contradiction. It's not any cause to say, oh, no, well, there must just be one person and, there, you know, there's, there's no distinction there or whatever. Like, it's, that's ridiculous. Uh, Hebrews 1, 2. Turn, if you would, to uh, John chapter 20. Hebrews 1, 2 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. I already read this, but I'm pointing out this, this verse. Hath spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And that gives us that distinction there, he, by whom he made the worlds. The Father made the worlds by Jesus Christ, by the Son specifically. And he uses the word, his Son. 
We're talking about the sonship of Jesus Christ. His son is being used. The, the, the words his son, not the word, not any other name, not some other thing before that he wasn't his son then. It's referring to the son in all these instances of events that take place prior to his actual physical birth. Now we have no reason also to believe that Jesus Christ hasn't always been the Son. Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. We know that God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. So why would we think that Jesus changed from not being the Son to being the Son? And continue, you know, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, even just from that verse alone. Jesus Christ is the same. Not today and forever, yesterday, today, and forever. John verse 20, look at ver uh, John chapter 20, look at verse number 31. Of course, we, we get from this passage that the book of John is written for people to be saved. Verse 31 says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Notice it doesn't say that Jesus became the Son of God. It says that Jesus is the Son of God. These things are written that you may know that Jesus is the Son of God. That this man, Jesus, that, that was crucified, that He is the Son of God. He didn't just become the Son of God. He is. This is written so that people can believe that Jesus, the man Jesus, is the Son of God. The Son of God that was to come. The Christ that was to come. The Son of God was to come. Jesus is that person. That's who we need to believe on. Flip back, if you would, just to chapter 16. A few, few pages back to chapter 16 in John. John 16, verse 27, the Bible says, For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, we see this father-son relationship a lot. Would it really make sense to be Jesus, to be calling God the Father, if he wasn't his father when he came forth from him. Are you following what I'm saying? So he's saying, I came forth from the father. He was the father when he was sent, when he was brought in this, not just when he was brought in his world, but even before that. He came forth from the father. He was with the father. We're going to see that in just a minute. He was with the father. And he refers to being with the father by name of the father. Not by any other name, by calling him the Father. John, uh, flip over to John chapter 17, because this is where we're going to see that. John 17, verse number 5, the Bible says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Again, there's a, another reference to a person, thine own self. With the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Jesus is speaking to the Father and he's saying, I had glory with you even before the world was, showing the eternal pre-existence of Jesus Christ and referring to God as the Father. Verse number 24, jump down to verse number 24. The Bible says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. I don't see how you could read that and not understand that there's a father-son relationship when he's talking about, Father, you gave me glory, and there's this love that you had with me and for me, and a glory that you've given me before even the creation. Before the world ever was, I was with you, and you glorified me, and, and you loved me before the foundation of the world just shows very clearly. I mean, 
You have to be unsaved or, or have your head in the sand to just deny all these scriptures that just proves that Jesus Christ was the Son of God going into eternity past. And even in the Old Testament, we have a, a hint or an indication. Now, I don't hang my hat on this one verse in the book of Daniel to prove the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ, but we've already looked at a lot of very clear scriptures. There's no problem with using other scriptures as supporting evidence. It's not the primary, you know, if someone asks me, why do you believe in eternal sonship of, of Christ? I'm not going to turn to Daniel 3.25. But I'll tell you what, Daniel 3.25 gives us a reference to, a son of, to the Son of God, referring to the Son. Daniel 3.25 reads this, and this is when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the furnace, right? And Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, he's looking down, he's like, wait, didn't I, didn't I cast three people into there? He says, I see four. I'll read it for you. He says, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And again, talking about the importance of the Bible versions, if you're a King James Bible only believer, you know, the other translations, well, he is like one of the sons of the gods, as opposed to the Son of God. Very different and very important. Very important distinction. Because he saw the Son of God walking with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who was with them for their faith and was blessing them and keeping them from being hurt by the flame because of their faith in him. But, I mean, again, you know, people might try to argue that and be like, oh, no, but that still wasn't about Jesus. That was some unsaved person, you know, whatever. The Bible knew he was talking about and it wrote the Son of God. God knew and that's what he said. That's what he was referring to, the Son of God. We also have a reference, again, I'm not going to say that this is the most solid evidence, but there's so much evidence that needs to be brought up. Turn if we go to Hebrews chapter 7, we'll, we'll see the passage about Melchizedek. Because we know that Jesus Christ is referred to as being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And some of these oneness people, I, I'm curious who they think Melchizedek even is or was because the Bible says that he is without father and without mother. Who is Melchizedek? Who is this guy? I know what I believe. I believe this is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament when he went to met Abraham. That's what I believe. I mean, the Bible says that no man hath seen God at any time, talking about God the Father, because you can't see God the Father and live for His glory. But you know what? A lot of people have seen the Son. That's what we have the New in the New Testament. That's what the Gospels are. They're witnesses. People have witnessed and our hands have handled of the Word of Life. That's what they're explaining. I, we, they've seen the Son. You, you have people that are so blinded that they'll tell you that, oh, no one's ever seen this. No one's ever seen Jesus. Like, what? It, like, I, when someone says that, that ought to be enough for you. If you've ever had any questions on the Trinity, you hear some things, you hear people bringing up some confusing verses. If that same person says, no one's ever seen Jesus, that ought to be enough for you to say, Bye-bye, I'm not going to listen to a word you have to say anymore because that is insane and ridiculous and God must have to really cloud up their understanding to some just extraordinary measure for someone to say that no one has ever seen Jesus and actually believe that. That is ridiculous. The whole reason why we believe on Jesus is because there's witnesses. There are witnesses to what he did and what he said and who he was. It's insanity. Hebrews 7. Let's look at Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 1, the Bible reads, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. And it goes on further to describe Melchizedek. Verse number three, without father, without mother, without descent, 
having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. The Bible says that Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. He was made like unto the Son of God in Abraham's day, before Jesus was born. And what's interesting also, it says he's without, not only without father, but without mother. The one is people will turn to look at this verse and say, oh, see, he's without father, so how can he be the son of God? If he doesn't have a father, then how can he be the son? Obviously, this is talking about physically on this earth. On this earth, when Melchizedek was walking around and met Abraham and, and you know, blessed him, he was not born into this world. He was just there. See, they try to use this as, oh, it's saying, like, if this was Jesus, but he doesn't have a father because he is the father or whatever. But what about without mother? Obviously, this is talking about he didn't have a father or a mother because he didn't physically, he wasn't physically born in this earth. When he showed up on the scene, he was just there for who knows how long, but he was there on this earth um, for this purpose, to meet Abraham and to bless him. And he has neither beginning of days nor end of life and abideth a priest continually. That's Jesus Christ. Let's jump down to verse number 21. We're almost done. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us. And see, this is important because seriously, who else is Melchizedek? If it's not an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, who else is without father, without mother, having neither beginning of days nor end of life? Only God carries those characteristics. Eternity past, eternity future, everything eternal. That's God. And the Bible says with God, these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So, we can't be the Father because no man has seen the Father. Yet people saw Melchizedek. Can't be the Holy Ghost. There's nothing in the Scripture at all to say that the, that the Holy Spirit is walking around in physical form ever. We're left with Jesus Christ. And it's even more evident when we see here that uh, it says he became us, this high priest, verse 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high, those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. It's the Son of God. The Son of God has existed as the Son in eternity past and will always be the Son of God into the eternity future. Last place I'll be turned, Revelation chapter 13. This should just kind of clinch it. It's a little bit of a shorter sermon tonight. We went through a lot of verses. Hopefully you stayed with it. Um, it's an important doctrine, though, and it's, and it's being attacked. Revelation chapter 13, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So, if Jesus Christ 
is the lamb. It says here he was slain from the foundation of the world. So from the very beginning, he was slain. Why? Because he, he's in eternity. We understand things in time. That's all we know. We were born, we have a birth date, we have, we have existence, and there's a death. And everything we do is, is bound by time. And it's hard to, it's a little difficult to comprehend timelessness or eternity for that matter because we know everything by start and end points. Everything, our whole existence is what we know. God is outside of time. That's how God knows the beginning from the end. God created time, space, matter, everything that we have is all created by God. He is outside of the system that he created and inside of the system that he created because by all things, all things consist by God. He created it all. So Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And I think what people have a problem with is saying, well, if he was the son, when was he, when did God, when did Jesus become the son going into eternity past? Well, when you're dealing with eternity, it's an it always has been. Just like there's always been God, there's always been the son, there's always been the Holy Spirit. That part may be a little bit difficult to kind of wrap your mind around. But the problem is because we're thinking in terms of time frame when God is outside. He's, he's eternal. He's always been and always will be. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Like it already happened. When the world was just created, it already happened. And that's also why we understand and know that Old Testament saints, people who were believers in the Lord, went to heaven when they died because Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. They didn't have to wait until time went by and Jesus Christ was embodied and actually died on the cross and rose again and then all those souls that were in hell or paradise or whatever then were able to transport into heaven. It's nonsense. That's a topic for another day, but I'm just, just to, it's along the same lines. It's because of this eternity concept and Jesus Christ being a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was the son from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ has always been the son of God. He'll always be the son of God. And there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us all the information that you have in scriptures that we need to know, that we need to know about you, that we need to know about how we ought to live our lives and the things that we ought to do, dear Lord. Um, I just pray that you would please help us to be vigilant against the uh, heretics and the, the false prophets that are out there trying to make confusion, trying to turn people away from the faith by their, their fables and their uh, lies, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to grow and to gain a much better understanding of you, of your son, of who you want us to be, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just, just open up our wisdom and Lord, stir up all of our spirits and help us to be a great blessing and an honor unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.